everyone, I'm Elaine Quijano. Democratic presidential hopefuls are in Detroit tonight for the second round of primary debates. The latest CBS News Battleground Tracker poll shows health care remains a dominant issue for Democrats in early voting states. They also say climate change and income inequality are very important. Michigan doesn't hold its primary until after Super Tuesday, but it's a critical state in the general election. While those issues are on the minds of those crucial voters, President Trump and Republican allies are putting race at the front of the 2020 conversation. The Washington Post reports this week that it's part of the president's campaign strategy. President Trump today said his recent attacks on Baltimore and Democratic Congressman Elijah Cummings, who is African-American, are not part of any strategy. The zero strategy, all it is is I'm pointing out facts. The most unsafe city in the country, in our country, is Baltimore. It's received as much money, it's, it receives top of the line, billions of dollars. Somebody said $15 billion over a short period of time. So there's no strategy, it's very simple. And Elijah Cummings is in charge of it. And he ought to take his oversight committee and he ought to park him in Baltimore and find out what happened to the $15 billion and a lot of other money. At the same time, the Democrats' congressional campaign arm is being criticized for lacking diversity. Its top staffer resigned Monday because of it, along with five other staffers. Let's bring in Caitlin Huey Burns, Ed O'Keefe, and Aaron Haynes Wack. Caitlin is a CBSN political reporter. Ed is a CBS News political correspondent, and Aaron is national writer on race and ethnicity for the Associated Press. Welcome to all of you. Aaron, Michigan went for Donald Trump over Hillary Clinton by fewer than 11,000 votes in 2016. And you report that nationally, African-American turnout rate dropped seven percentage points in 2016 from its record high during Obama's 2012 re-election, but that Democrats insist they'll reverse the decline in 2020 how are they planning to do that? Well, I think that what uh, Democrats are planning to do is engage those voters well ahead of the primary to make sure that they turn out and show up in 2020. Because what we know is that something like 2 million black voters, uh, 2 million fewer black voters participated in the 2016 election than in the 2012 election, which saw record high black turnout. And, you know, those voters truly stayed home, not unlike other voters, but also there were issues of voter suppression at play. And frankly, the Democratic Party took some of those voters for granted and did not actively uh, seek their vote and try to convince them not just to vote against uh, Republicans and, and President Trump, but to, but to vote for something. And so I think that uh, this time around, they are certainly making note of that, uh, particularly young black men, a lot of them that I spoke to. Uh, did not feel engaged in the last election cycle. And so uh, reaching out to them in particular is going to be key uh, for boosting that turnout headed into November. Well, Caitlin, in the 2018 exit poll, 56 percent of voters disapproved of how President Trump is handling his job, with most strongly disapproving. How confident do Democrats feel about their chances in the state in 2020 at this point? And have they been making Michigan a priority so far? Well, I think by holding the Democratic debate here in Detroit, Democrats are signaling that they are not going to take Michigan for granted or be caught flat-footed here uh, heading into 2020. You mentioned that President Trump won the state, breaking a decades-long losing streak for Republicans, but he only won it by less than 11,000 votes. That's not a lot. Democrats see a lot of opportunity now that they have the 2018 midterms behind them, which saw uh, record turnout in some of these counties and also elected five Democrats to statewide office, including uh, the governor, and also flipped two congressional seats uh, as well. And so Democrats feel like there is a big opening to compete here in Michigan. The question is, how much time are they going to spend here? I will say that I talked to the Democratic chair here in Michigan who told me that it's great Democrats are here for the debate, but they have to keep coming back and speaking to voters. And there is kind of a debate in the party right now about what a winning coalition in a state like Michigan would look like. If you look at uh, the turnout numbers in 2016, Hillary Clinton underperformed uh, among African American voters and base voters in the city centers, more urban areas. So do you spend more time in places like Detroit or do you go to places where independent voters or former Democrats switched over to support Donald Trump? 
a lot of people here are arguing that they can do both, but it'll be really interesting to see kind of how the candidates address that tonight and tomorrow night and moving forward. When we talk about the Midwest, what exactly uh, does a winning coalition look like? Yeah, no, it's a very good question. Well, Ed, how have Democratic campaigns been reacting to President Trump's recent attacks on both Congressman Cummings and earlier this month when he targeted four Congresswomen of color? As, exactly as you might expect, by, by once again reinforcing that they believe the president is racist or that his statements are racist uh, and that they would try to be a far more unifying figure. But I, I can tell you, Elaine, uh, we may dwell on it in the news media, but we talked to voters here in Michigan. They really don't want to hear about that anymore. They, they said to us uh, over the last few days that they'd rather see these guys be talking about issues, especially health care, the cost of health care. Uh, perhaps climate change, how they're going to create jobs, and how they would reunify this fractured country. There's less of an interest in, in sort of reinforcing that they are opposed to or have concerns about the president and more interest in what exactly they would do if they were elected president. And so uh, it, it would sort of behoove candidates tonight to get off the issue of the president himself because that's kind of the default setting for any of these Democrats and instead try to focus on what it is they would do should they somehow win the White House. Interesting. Um, Aaron, has President Trump been doing anything to try to appeal to black voters? Well, he certainly suggests that he is, and he uh, actually is saying that his comments about Baltimore are something that have been welcomed by the African-American community, saying that his phone has been ringing off the hook at the White House, uh, hearing from African-Americans, uh, you know, thanking him uh, for, for, for the comments that he made regarding Congressman Cummings and, and the city of Baltimore um, describing it as corrupt and, and crime infested. Uh, but, but, you know, the latest poll numbers show something like 6 percent uh, support uh, among the black uh, community for President Trump, which would be even less support than he got uh, from black voters in, in 2016. And so uh, for a lot of the voters that I talk to, black voters on the campaign trail, what they tell me is that racism is very much on the ballot for them. Uh, and the comments that they are hearing, the rhetoric and the policies uh, that they see coming from the White House are, are something that is motivating them to head to the polls as much as issues like the economy, health care and education. Interesting. Well, this happens as a Democrat's congressional campaign arm is undergoing a staff shakeup of relating to diversity. Ed, here's what Congresswoman and DCCC chair Sherry Bustos told you last month about the staff. You and I are sitting in the building um, where the Democratic Congressional Campaign Committee um, is located. And um, if you walked upstairs, you would see the most diverse staff that you've ever seen in this building. Uh, the people, our advisors, our counselors, uh, are the most diverse advisors and counselors and vendors that you've ever seen in the history of this, of, of, of House Democrats. Um, the, the candidates that we're recruiting are the, the most diverse ever and will inspire. Um, and, and it's because of all of these reasons that I think we're going to have a great 2020. So, Ed, this might seem like inside baseball to folks watching, but how big of a problem is this root issue for Democrats? This issue, Elaine, speaks to the larger battle that's underway in the party, as, as we've been talking about. Do you go after minority voters, urban voters in the big cities in these states that Democrats lost last time, or do you try to have a broader argument made to a broader cross-section of voters across those states and in other parts of the country. At the DCCC for House Democrats, a caucus now that is predominantly female and a majority minority, there was concern that while Bustos was saying all the right things to us, the reality was far different. And so five senior staffers this week quit, in part because black, Latino, Asian and female and gay lawmakers raised concerns that Democrats were not raising uh, the right issues, hiring the correct people, or focused on the right issues in order to win support from minority, younger, uh, and female voters across the country. It's a real problem that the party continues to have in all sorts of ways. This is just the latest encapsulation of it. It's a tough time to be having this kind of a shakeup because you're entering the longest break of the year when members are going to be back home talking to voters, possibly fundraising, beginning to think about their re-election campaigns. And the organization that's responsible for helping them with that is totally in flux. But this is not the last time we will see this kind of conflict within the Democratic Party because it's part of an ongoing conversation, as it is across society in many different ways, concerns about diversity of all sorts 
in these times, these types of organizations. Right, and it is a conversation that's happening in a broader society. And Caitlin, I want to get your thoughts as well because you raised this notion of a coalition. What might that look like, a winning coalition? And I guess what I'm wondering is from your conversations with various campaign officials, is there a sense that this is in fact a zero-sum game? That is, if you go after a certain group, it will definitely be at the expense of another group. Is that how various campaigns view this? Or is there belief, a belief among some that in fact it is still possible to have various uh, differing groups of people coming together under the banner of one party? Yeah, it's a great question, and we have been asking various candidates about this, and they all maintain that Democrats can do both at once, that they can rally the base around issues, but also try to appeal uh, to voters who didn't choose Democrats last time around. Bernie Sanders last week in Detroit, uh, when I was here for the NAACP conference, he said that what his message to voters here in Michigan uh, across, across the state is that, you know, Donald Trump promised you a lot of things. It, are they working for you? How is your health care? Do you have access to it? How are your wages? I talked to uh, Brenda Lawrence, the congressman, congresswoman uh, who represents Michigan here uh, just earlier today, and she said that when candidates come to a place like Detroit, they can appeal to voters here and across the state by talking about local issues, by talking about the economy. The economy does look strong on paper. It's something that Donald Trump is going to be running his reelection on if it maintains at a steady pace. But uh, the congresswoman was telling me that voters here really don't feel like the economy is working for them yet. They're still dealing with debt, student debt, access to health care, health care costs. Education is a huge issue here as well. So Democrats here say that, uh, that a mix of all of this is uh, something that can win. And they point to Gretchen Whitmer, the governor, as someone who flipped nine counties that voted for Trump. Trump uh, in her election in 2018 by running a, a, a campaign on economics, running on fixing the roads, on infrastructure, kind of a middle of the road campaign. And you also need a, a candidate who can excite people, who can bring people out. So it's a challenge, certainly, for Democrats here and across uh, in other states that they lost last time around. Mm. Well, Aaron, I know you've been reporting on Beto O'Rourke's guests in the audience tonight. You write that they are three young black men from Michigan who were inspired by ex-NFL player Colin Kaepernick to kneel during the national anthem before their high school football games. How has Beto O'Rourke talked about issues of race in his current campaign? Well, we've seen Beto O'Rourke continue a conversation that he began, as you said, uh, as, as a candidate for, for U.S. Senate out of Texas, uh, where he made that viral video that made him really a national figure and, and catapulted him into this 2020 field of, of Democratic presidential primary hopefuls. Uh, on the campaign trail, he has talked about systemic racism uh, quite frequently, and that's both in front of black and white audiences, uh, as well as just recently in a Medium post revealing that he and his wife, Amy, recently discovered that their ancestors owned uh, enslaved uh, black people in this country during slavery. And uh, he, is, he is somebody that's come out in support of reparations. Uh, and so, you know, I think that his choice of, of, of these three young men who uh, are from the Lansing area and, and uh, decided to, you know, to kneel in protest uh, during the national anthem um, because of racism and, and because of the racism that they had experienced, frankly, uh, as young men themselves, uh, is, is, is uh, pretty much uh, in keeping with, with the kind of uh, issues that, that he tends to gravitate towards. and. and Obviously, young people, um, his message has resonated with young people, even though I, I will add that uh, these three young men are all uh, going to be voting in their first uh, presidential election, mm -hmm. uh, that, this, that they weren't of age to, to vote uh, the last time around. Uh, and at least uh, one of them, um, Michael Lynn III, uh, the quarterback and team captain that I spoke to, uh, tells me that he is still undecided. So mm -hmm. uh, maybe he won't just be watching the work tonight, but we'll be watching the entire panel to to try to make a decision on who he might cast his ballot for next year. Yeah, that is interesting to see that he's observing this for the first time as someone who will be participating uh, in his first presidential election. Uh, Ed, let me ask you, this week's debates are the first since the Robert Mueller hearings. At least 105 House Democrats and two of the top four Senate Democrats say they support an impeachment inquiry into President Trump. That number is still relatively small, but it is growing. Have Democratic candidates been changing their tune at all when it comes to impeachment? 
No. <laughs> Quite frankly, they, they continue to say that it's something that they, uh, you know, support, uh, think should happen, but they also make the point that it's up to Congress to figure out exactly how and over the course of what process exactly to do it. Uh, take Joe Biden, for example, who has said he thinks there's enough there, but it's up to the House to work through a methodical process to get it done. Uh, the, the more interesting question to keep an eye on is if and when they get asked, do you think there's enough there to prosecute him once he's no longer in office? If the answer ever gets to a full-blown yes, that's kind of an interesting and uncharted territory because that is essentially on par with what Donald Trump threatened Hillary Clinton with during their final debate during the 2016 campaign, this idea that if he were president, she would be in jail, the politicization of prosecution. And so you've seen Democrats talk about the possibility that it might happen, that maybe there is enough to do it, uh, but they stopped short of saying that they would do it or that they would insist on it were they elected president, because that, again, is kind of seen as a bridge too far, perhaps, at least politically, for them at this point. Anyone who does say that obviously puts themselves on the far left fringe. And we have to reinforce this again. It gets a lot of chatter. But you come out here into the real world, it doesn't come up. Impeachment is never raised by voters. If it is, it's, I don't want to hear anything more about it. Talk to me again about what you would do if you were in charge. Democrats learned that lesson last year when they won control of the House. That's why many of the presidential candidates would prefer to keep focused on that kind of approach as well. Yeah, it'll be interesting to see how that lesson actually manifests itself on the debate stage tonight and tomorrow. Uh, Caitlin, Senate Majority Leader Mitch McConnell blocked, uh, has blocked two election security bills and called criticism of his moves modern-day McCarthyism. Could we see Democrats focus more of their attention on McConnell while they figure out what to do about impeachment? Well, they are focused on McConnell. We saw that in the last debate because they were asked, you're proposing all of these big, bold agenda items. How would you possibly get them through a Republican senator, a uh, Senate uh, led by Mitch McConnell? And uh, there's also, I would say, you know, after the Mueller hearings last week, um, talking to different candidates and campaigns, a big takeaway they had was, look, uh, we're still really concerned about election interference in 2020. I talked to the Michigan Secretary of State yesterday who uh, talked about all sorts of steps they're trying to take here in the state and try to get the administration to pay close attention to it as well and get the resources they need for election security here. And they're really concerned about disinformation as well. So I think that uh, those are a couple avenues that you'll see Democrats take uh, against Mitch McConnell and against uh, the president as it relates to what we should take away. All right, Caitlin Hubie Burns, Ed O'Keefe, and Aaron Haynes Wack, thank you so much.